and then eventually I made the piece that became Dark Cave. Um, and the key that unlocked that thing was often a piece of music, or in, in a lot of cases, they were literary touchstones or pieces of writing. Um, there's, I think, interface in this work with you know, um, issues of globalism, identity, um, all kinds of um, theoretical or, or you know, philosophical concepts, but really the grounding in the work is, for the most part, really emotionally driven, and is a lot of it, and for instance, um, the piece that happens um, sort of almost near the end that has all the names in it, um, the piece that was called I Hung Back, Held Fire, Danced, and Live, is actually all the people's names in that piece were people that I've known who died of AIDS. So it was a kind of memorial piece. Um, or uh, the piece called Confirmed Bachelor, for instance, the piece that uses the kind of insane, I don't know how clearly you were able to follow that deranged text. But in the mid-90s, there was a, made by conservative Republicans in the United States, there was a sort of um, propaganda tape made called The Gay Agenda, which purported to analyze gay sex um, statistically and to prove, I, I had never heard, for instance, before the gay agenda, and I've been very gay for very long, um, I had never heard the term mud rolling before. I don't know about any of you, maybe you're all practicing mud rolling, I don't know, um, but it was, a, it was a revelation to me to discover that 38% of homosexuals practice Mud roll. <laughs> so I guess I've been missing out of the lucky, you know, I'm, I'm part of the 62% missing the exciting adventure of mud rolling. Um, I think that one of the diff most difficult parts about this piece for me was that the grounding in my work previous to making experimental work had been performance work. And so I was a performer in my work. There's a whole body of photographic work I had done when I was in a graduate student in the 1980s, unwittingly sort of duplicating the work of Cindy Sherman. I had not seen it at all. I did a series of self-portraits where I performed different characters, and someone said, uh, Cindy Sherman, and that cut that work dead on its tracks. So for a long time, I had never put myself in my work. Um, and so one of the challenges in making this piece, specifically because uh, a very, very dear friend of mine, who's a member, a founding member of Grand Fury, um, the AIDS activist collective that I was a part of, and I spoke a bit about in the seminar, died. And I was with him when he died. And during the, the period of time when he died, he had, you know, the, HIV for a very, very long time, and it was right at the period of time that um, antiretroviral drugs had been introduced, and unfortunately they came too late for him, so he wasn't able to get well. And so there was a declared day when he was going to die. He knew that he was going to take his life, and I agreed to be the person with him. And in order to sort of prepare for that cathartic event, I listened over and over, for whatever reason, to that Roxy music track. So it became a kind of necessity on a personal level to put myself back into the work, to deal directly with the idiom of music video, in other words, lip syncing on camera, I needed to bring something full circle. I have to confess now, it's a decade later looking at this work, I find it necessarily uncomfortable to watch it in a room full of people to see my big crazy face up on the screen wearing silver paint and the rest of it, um, but it brought full circle, I think, the aesthetic um, and sort of conceptual framework for the work. There's a book that I've mentioned a bunch in my seminar and that I've read, it's, I wouldn't consider it theory as such, but it's highly entertaining cultural history, and I'd recommend it to any of you to read it. It's a book by a writer named Jonah Lehrer, and the book, you'll not find it easy to forget the title, it's called Proust Was a Neuroscientist. And it's basically a book looking at um, modernist writers and artists and, and all kinds of creative people, and talking about how within modernism, much of the things that neuroscience has discovered in the last 50 to 70 years have been predicted by some of these things. For instance, he calls, you know, he says, Proust was a neuroscientist because Proust was one of the people who understood that sense, the senses of smell and taste were different than the other three senses of touch, hearing, and sight. Because taste and smell have now been proved by neurophysicists to be, to go right into the cerebral cortex and to allow us to um, tap and access memory in a way that's profoundly different than the other senses. So I brought a little text from this that I just want to read briefly, just a short piece of um, his essay, which is he's writing about Virginia Woolf. Um, and he talks in this essay about how Virginia Woolf manifested a unified subjectivity that, that, however, in terms of the way she expressed it, was about ultimate fragmentation. And there was something in this about the idea, because I, when I look at this work, it's about kind of um, collision and compression and the kind of, you know, trying, aiming for a kind of um, visual clarity in terms of the cutting of it. But it's also uh, about a sort of, you know, trying to present a unified identity of myself while at the same time showing the kind of fragmentation of my own identity. So this is writing about sort of some of the um, figures within quote-unquote modernism and particularly um, leading to Virginia Woolf. He says, 
This vision of a mercurial mind, a self divided against itself, was one of the central tenets of modernism. Nietzsche said it first, quote, my hypothesis is the subject as multiplicity, he wrote in a terse summary of his philosophy. Quote, I is another, Rimbaud wrote soon after. William James, who was the brother of Henry James and one of the early psychologists in America, William James devoted a large portion of his chapter on the self and the principles to, quote, mutations of the self, those moments when we become aware of our other simultaneously existing consciousnesses. Freud agreed, and he shattered the mind into a network of conflicting drives. T.S. Eliot, Eliot converted this idea into a theory of literature, disowning, quote, the metaphysical theory of the substantial unity of the soul. He believed that the modern poet had to give up the idea of expressing the unified soul simply because we didn't have one. <coughs> quote, the poet has not a personality to express, Eliot wrote, but a particular medium, which is only a medium and not a personality. Like so many modernists, Eliot wanted to pierce our illusions, revealing us not as we want to be, but as we are, just the rubble of being, some random scraps of sensation. Wolf echoed Eliot, writing in her diary, that we are, quote, splinters and mosaics, not as they used to hold, immaculate, monolithic, consistent holes. So real as it seems, the modernists got the brain right. Experiment after experiment has shown that any giving, given experience can endure for about 10 seconds in short-term memory. After that, the brain exhausts its capacity for the present tense, and its consciousness must begin anew with a new stream. As the modernists anticipated, the permanent seeming self is actually an endless procession of disjointed moments. This is something I read years. Now, this is something I'm reading now and really resonated with me in terms of this piece. I really think it kind of is, a, in some ways, a key that helps me understand my own work. So the last piece I want to show you is the, the oldest of the work I'm showing. It's a piece from 1993. It's roughly 30 minutes in length. It's a commissioned film. It's called Jeffrey Bean 30. I had a very peculiar once in a career experience. I made a first feature film called Swoon. It was released theatrically in the United States. I received a fan letter on very heavy Cartier stationery, stationery I'd never seen before this piece that said, Dear Tom Kalin, I don't know if you know who I am, but I'm a fashion designer and I would like to meet you to talk about a project. It was from a person named Jeffrey Bean. Jeffrey Bean had been a fashion designer for many years. He's famous among for very small reasons and sort of could never have a heart to bring myself to um, interrogate him about this particular point. He designed Trisha Nixon's wedding dress, among other things. We never broached that subject. But he invited me to make a movie commemorating thir 30 years as a fashion designer. I said, look, I don't really do commercial work so much. He said, I'm not really looking for commercial work. You can you do anything you want for me as long as you show clothes from 30 years. So I decided to make a 30-minute film using actors to explore and, and revisit some of the conventions of silent film. Those of you who know Cocteau, for instance, will see very clearly, although Cocteau is not a part of silent film, that I'm, I'm, I'm giving strong homage to figures like Cocteau in this piece, but also some of the German expressionist filmmakers. So this is Jeffrey Bean, 30. It's from 1993.